أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين My elders, brothers, sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My felicitations to all of you on this auspicious night. It's also a Thursday night, which is a night full of blessings, but on top of that is Eid al Zahra. It's the night of the beginning of the wilaya of our awaited 12th Imam, Ajalallahu Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. May our lives be sacrificed for him and may Allah give us the tawfiq to be amongst his close companions, insha'Allah. And that's why I chose this topic, the waiting game, uh, the awaited savior is accepted by all, most of the religions. They are all waiting for the awaited savior, especially with the conditions that are prevailing in the world just now. Intadar, active intadar, there are almost 300, 300 ahadith talking about the 12th holy imam from our holy prophet and from almost five imams. So there's no doubt about the return of this imam, although doubts are being planted in the youths. There should be no doubt whatsoever. There is a hadith from our Holy Prophet Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And this is from our Sunni brothers books. He says, the Al-Qaim will be from my progeny. And he will fill the earth with justice and equality. After it has been filled with injustice. Dhulman wa jawra. A very authentic hadith. So he is the awaited one and there is a waiting game to be played which has been going on for the longest time from the death, from the wafat of the 11th Holy Imam which we commemorated yesterday when the Imam was only five years old. To date, it's by far the biggest imtihan on the Muslim Ummah or for the Shias of Ahlul Bayt. Active in Tadar, how to prepare ourselves and how to prepare the society for the return of the 12th Imam. It's a game, it's a waiting game that needs to be played with a lot of attention and with a lot of seriousness. So this is the waiting game that we need to play for the coming of the 12th Holy Imam. Allah himself also plays the waiting game and he is by far the foremost player when it comes to the waiting game. When we see the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we usually don't understand it very well and we see why is he giving so much time. We see shaitan has been given time till the day of judgment. And so many of the tyrants, we look at Fir'aun and the disbelievers at the time of Nuh, Nabi Nuh. The time that they were given, the grace period that they were given, the waiting game. So look at this verse, chapter 11, verse number 121. وَقُلِّ الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ 
وقل للذين لا يؤمنون اعملوا على مكانتكم انا عاملون say to those who do not have faith act according to your ability and we too are acting according to our ability allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying and then the next verse so wantadiru inna muntadirun and wait and we too are waiting so allah is also playing the waiting game he is defying the pharaohs of the time that act the way you want you wait and we too are waiting another verse which is very interesting chapter 6 verse number 158 a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim hal yanzuruna illa an ta'tiyahumul mala'ikatu aw ya'tiya rabbuka aw ya'tiya ba'du ayati rabbik do they not consider that the angels may come to them or your lord may come or some of your lord's signs may come yawma ya'ti ba'du ayati rabbik the day when some of your lord's signs do come we await the signs of allah so allah says when the signs of allah do come la yanfa'u nafsan imanuha lam takun amanat min qabl aw kasabat fi imaniha khayra qul intadiru inna muntadirun the day when some of the lord's signs do come faith shall not benefit any soul that had not believed beforehand and had not earned some goodness in his faith say wait and we too are waiting the words of sheikh sakalashwar may allah increase his knowledge inshallah the lecture that he gave in zanzibar i saw the recorded version his series on tawhid he says if you have not understood tawhid you will not understand the truth of imam but if you look at this verse and these are his words that he mentioned sheikh sakalashwar that when the twelfth imam comes that will not be the time to learn tawhid that will be the deadline after that one will not be able to reform himself so coming of the twelfth imam is a deadline we need to work on ourselves now if you have to understand tawhid it is now this verse clearly says that when the signs do come when the zuhur of the 12th imam does happen which will be a sign of allah he says only the preparation that we had done before the appearance will be of benefit to us no preparations will be possible after the appearance of the 12th imam so we have our work cut out here there is a deadline that is awaiting us and we need to work hard before we reach the deadline so allah says qul intadiru inna muntadirun wait and we too are waiting so there's a waiting game going on between allah and us so there's a whole series so the other word for the waiting game would be sabr patience but patience the way we have understood it most of the time is just to sit passively and kuvumilia to to be able to withstand pressures that we are facing or just to sit quietly and tolerate that is not sabr there are discourses of sabr that have been compiled these are the lectures of ayatollah khamenei and it's worth read a very small booklet is there online also discourses on sabr whereby he explains what is sabr he says on the basis of traditions and this is purely based on hadith ayatollah khamenei says we are not going to go into the quran just based on the authentic hadith he says on the basis of traditions patience is defined as the resistance shown by man on the road towards perfection against mischief corruption and degradation 
So there's got to be some sort of resistance. He gives an example of climbing a mountain. For those of you who love mountaineering, who have gone up mountains, Kilimanjaro or Meru, the high altitudes. Alhamdulillah, I was fortunate enough to, to go. And it's an imtihan. Especially when you reach the higher levels, the heights, there's less of oxygen, your brain is not working properly. You literally take five steps and you're tired. There you have two choices. Either you persist and you go on till you reach the peak or you go back. Atullah Khamenei says when you persist and you fight against yourself, overcoming all the difficulties within you and without, and the difficulties that you have outside, the steepness, the rocks, the slippery soil, that is all outside. And within you is your willpower. When you overcome all those obstacles and still reach the peak, that is called sabr. So it's not just passively tolerating what is coming upon us. So the waiting game of the 12th Holy Imam, the waiting game of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these were several reasons. Mehbubai understands the waiting game quite well. He gives me a notice long, almost a month before, and I keep him waiting. Till the very last moment, I think I gave you this topic yesterday. So he's very familiar with the waiting game. So that's just another reason that I chose this topic. But for those who are interested in politics, would have understood why I have chosen this topic, the waiting game. The current events that are going on, we are now advised, don't use the word Middle East. Middle East, the word Middle East should not be used. Mashariki Akati, I think in Swahili they use it. Middle East. This is a colonial, colonial term. You should use Western Asia. So West Asia is the term that should be used. This is what the political analysts are telling us. So what is going on in West Asia just now? the genocide that is unfolding in front of our eyes in Gaza and the West Bank. So it all started October 7th, 2023. And since then, we have three tiers, three levels. We have the Hamas and the Islamic Jihad warriors on the ground in Gaza and West Bank. And then you have the supporting forces. So you have Hezbollah on one side, Ansarullah on one side, and Hashdu Shabi from Iraq. And Iran is between these two levels. So second tier is Hezbollah, Ansarullah, and Hashdu Shabi. Iran would, has moved a layer up now. It was in second tier, now it's in third tier. Is along with Russia and China on top. Although it has been attacked and the occupying entity really wants Iran to get involved. So there was an attack on the Syrian, the Iranian embassy in Syria. That was a provocation. And of course the assassination of Ismail Haniya in Tehran just after the inauguration of the new President, the whole aim is to drag Iran in and escalate the situation. So people ask, now that it's approaching one year since the October 7th happened, people often ask, and I also ask, that why doesn't Iran just go in and finish the job? And some people also say the Ridwan forces, the special forces of Hezbollah, why can't they just go in and finish the job? It may seem like the situation is right to go in and do it. We are told that the resistance, axis of resistance has never been this strong. And Israel, the occupying entity, has never been this low this low when it comes to their strength. 
So isn't this the opportune, the best time to go in and finish the job? But this is where the waiting game comes in. The waiting game needs to be played. And we need to understand what this waiting game has done, this patience that has been shown by the excess of resistance on all fronts. So there's one front that is actively fighting. There's one for front that is just distracting the enemy. And then there's one front that is just suffocating the supplies to the occupying entity. They're playing the waiting game. So look at this hadith before I go ahead. Utlubu li'ilm wa law kana fi sin or bi sin. Seek knowledge even if it is from China. This is a hadith from our holy prophet. Interestingly, I went through some Sunni sites and they say that this hadith is daif. It's not a very authentic hadith. But Ayatollah Mutahari talks about this hadith. He says the reason China has been mentioned here in those times. So maybe it was to give importance to seeking knowledge, one. But secondly, he says that no, China is an old civilization, 2,000 year old civilization. And that, that knowledge had creeped in, had come down to the Arabian Peninsula at that time. So people knew what China is and what was coming from there, the wisdom that was coming from there. So I don't know if you've heard of this, The Art of War. There's a book by the name of The Art of War, Sun Tzu. I heard about it, Sun Tzu is the way you pronounce it. It's a wisdom that is almost 2,000 years old from China, The Art of War. And I heard this from Pepe Escobar, he is one of my favorite analysts. And he talked about, he talks about this book quite often. So I downloaded the book and very interesting facts. But one of the arts of war, he says, one should never interrupt the enemy when he's in total panic. When the enemy is in total panic, don't interrupt him. There's a downward spiral going on. This is 2000 year old wisdom. And we are told take knowledge even if it's from China. So this is very applicable just now. When the enemy is in total panic, don't interrupt him. There's a process ongoing. Play the waiting game and enjoy it. And then in April, there was an article in the cradle. The cradle is a good site for those of you who are interested in geopolitics and politics. I've mentioned it several times, avoid the mainstream media. So BBC, CNN, Fox News, they will distort your thinking. They will give you the wrong information. But the alternative media, the independent media, so Grey Zone, Cradle, and I had mentioned a few political analysts, so Pepe Escobar, Scott Ritter, Richard Medhurst, he's going to, he's going to, Sorry? Alistair Crook. Alistair Crook, yes. Alistair Crook, former British diplomat. Yes. So these are the sources that we should be looking at. So Cradle in April of 2024 brought out this article. Some of you might have read it. How do Iranians boil a frog slowly, slowly and methodically? A beautiful article written by Shivan Mahendra Raja, and it went viral. So there's a theory or a legend, a story that says that if a frog is placed in a shallow pot of water, so a frog is placed in a shallow pot of water heating on a stove, so initially it's cold, the frog is put inside and slowly, slowly you're heating that, that pot, one degree at a time. The frog will remain happily in the pot of water as the temperature continues to climb. 
and will not jump out even as the water slowly reaches boiling point and kills the frog. Will achura hataru. The temperature is rising very, very slowly and he doesn't realize. And before it's too late, the change of one degree of temperature at a time is so gradual that the frog doesn't realize he's being boiled until it's too late. This is the boiling of the frog. This is the waiting game. So when this article was published, suddenly people started understanding that what game is being played by the axis of resistance. There was proper coordination. There was an active part and there was a waiting game they played in the background. So recently, just a week back, uh, there's a lady by the name of Sharmin Narwani. Sharmin Narwani in the cradle. He's also, she's also from cradle. And she did a presentation in the University of Beirut on the 2nd of September. This is just a week back. And it's a must. Everybody should listen to this. It's a long one. But I'll try to summarize it. And she talks about this frog that is being boiled, the waiting game, and what effects it has had on the occupying entity. So she says the frog, that is Israel, is standing on two feet now. So it's not on fours, it's standing on two feet. What are those two feet? One foot is the myth, the fairy tales that they've created for themselves, the 2,000 year old fairy tales, the promised land, and the Holocaust. And they play the victim. Okay, we are the victims, we were kicked out from Europe, and now we have come to settle in this promised land. This is their one leg. So people feel sorry for them. This is sympathy that people have towards them. And number two, the second leg. They portrayed it to be the safest place for Jews to live. So Jews around the world should be motivated or should be attracted towards this promised land. So they've given all sorts of facilities in Israel. So these are two legs that the frog stands on. And she says October 7th broke both these legs. So the boiling is going on. She says in a scenario that say in April of 2024, if Iran had reacted immediately, or right from the beginning, October 7th, if Iran got involved, taking Israel to be weak, she says, immediately it would have galvanized all the allies against Iran, and that's already happening. The moment you see Iran talking about retaliation, you see warships going into the Persian Gulf, or into the Mediterranean Sea. And that small attack that happened in April in retaliation, you saw how many countries were involved. France, Italy, Jordan, the US, of course, and Britain. So many jet fighters, 200 jet fighters came to assist. So she says, if Iran was involved right from the beginning, if they had not played the waiting game. Immediately it would have galvanized all the countries against Iran and that's exactly what Israel wanted. Not only that, but all the Jews in diaspora, the Jews who are still outside Israel, they also would have united to come and protect the so-called promised land. So the waiting game has worked. It's almost approaching one year now, 11 months. It's going to be one year. This has not materialized. So we'll come to how much of the capacity that Iran has used. We'll come to that later on. And you see now what the waiting game has done. Initially, when October 7th happened, we had Rishi Sunak going in a military plane with all the supplies into Tel Aviv, showing sympathy. Biden going to Tel Aviv. Ursula von der Leyen of the EU also going and showing sympathy. Oh, we are with you. Yeah, and all of them going to Israel to show solidarity. Today, the same countries 
are banning the export of arms to these countries, to, to Israel. Although this, they're using third countries to bring arms in, but in the media they're showing that no, we are banning the sale of arms to Israel. You see UK announced recently 30% cut in export of arms to Israel, Norway, Italy is also talking about it, but they all use third countries, so they use Greece. But in the media, it is portrayed as, as if they're banning. Why? Because they have their public on the streets. There are demonstrations happening in their countries. UK, we've seen the demonstrations like never before. So there's so much pressure, they have to show that they're doing something. But the waiting game is exposing this because we have the alternative media. And it is proving day in, day out that arms are still being sent. So the pressure is building up on these, on these countries. So effects of the boiling frog. The frog is being boiled. Sharmin from Cradle mentions, she says there are four, four effects. There's military effect, there's economical effect of the waiting game of the frog being boiled. There's a political effect and there's an effect on the society, Israeli society. So I want you to listen carefully to these statistics. Militarily, Israel is spending millions of dollars a day for this military exercise. The number of soldiers, they call in reservists, the arms, the fuel that they're using since they went into Gaza and they're not getting any success there. Millions of dollars a day. So far, they say they've, they've already used up 67.3 to 80 billion dollars since October 7th. So they're being drained of that wealth. October 7th, they had 2,200 Merkava tanks or other types of tanks. They say 500 have been destroyed. Almost 25% of them have been destroyed. Now what is interesting is the cradle has taken all this news from the Hebrew outlets. They've taken it from Israel. So this is from the Israeli source. 25% of the tanks have been destroyed. So it has an army of almost 500,000 Israel. They've called in reservists. 10,000 have been injured. This is from their sources. 10,000 soldiers injured, 704 soldiers dead. This is from their sources again. 30% have mental disorders. 30% of the Israeli army have developed mental disorders. 37% have missing limbs. Either the legs or hands are gone. 37%. This is the boiling frog. These are the effects of the waiting frog. Of the boiling frog, sorry. And of the waiting game. And economists project that if this war goes on, or if the war stops today, if the war stops today, they will need $50 billion, $50 billion with a B, in the next five years to repair the damage that has been done. Just mental health, $50 billion in the next five years. This is the effect of the waiting game. Retired Major General Isaac Brick, you can see his YouTube clips. He's been talking since October 7th, giving comments on what is happening. Jitsak Brick, he was an IDF soldier, a major commander. He says, these are his words, that Israel will collapse within one year. If this war goes on, they're going to collapse within a year. They won't even survive one year. So that's the damage that they're going through just now. And then they put up a military escalation ladder. So they say the Israeli army, the IDF and Hamas are at 100%. 100% of the resources are being used in the war in Gaza. Hezbollah is at 60%. The conflict that Hezbollah is involved in, in the northern border of, of Israel, so southern Lebanon, they have used only 60% of their resources. So they still have room to escalate. Ansarullah stand at 40%. 1,000 
what we see, the heroics of Ansarullah in the Red Sea and a little bit in the Mediterranean scene in Tel Aviv, they've used only 40% of their capabilities. So they have a room of escalating 60%. Israel is already at 100%. No room to escalate. And Iran is lowest on the ladder. It has used only 20% of its resources or less. Only one attack in April. Other than that, they have not used any of the resources. So there's an 80% capability of escalating. So this is the waiting game. You see how it has been planned. The reserves that are there and the effects that it could bring in. So this is as far as military effects. Political effects, 75% of the Israelis say, Israeli population say they're not happy with the government's handling of the war in Gaza. 75%. And we can see the demonstration. They've already had five governments in five years, or four governments in five years, election upon election. The hostage crisis that we saw, 500,000, 750,000 people on the streets in Tel Aviv, demonstrating against the hostage crisis. So this is the political effect. 46% feel, 46% of Israelis feel that there's going to be a civil war. So if the war was to stop today, there would be a war amongst themselves. 46%. And because of the waiting game, now that 11 months have passed, the recognition of Palestine has gone up. 143 countries out of 193 voted in favor of Palestine having a permanent seat in the United Nations. Not only that, but we have countries that are cutting relationship with the Zionist entity. So pop Palestine is becoming more popular. Israel is being exposed. The global image of Israel is going down. All this time, or oh, the perfect democracy and the victim that they were playing, it is all being exposed. Economically, so we say militarily, politically, look at the effects to the economy. Israel has always survived on investment. They've always survived on direct investment from outside. So investment since October 7th has gone down by 70%, 7-0. When a country loses 70% of foreign investment, you can imagine what's happening to the economy. So many universities have divested from Israel. They don't have an exchange program now with Israel. There was a report in the Israeli media, 46,000 businesses have closed down. 46,000 businesses have closed down and they're projecting it's going to reach up to 60,000 in the next one or two years if the war goes on. So they've always portrayed themselves as a startup nation. You want to start up a business? The best place was Israel. Startup nation. Now it has become a, shut, a shutdown nation. Businesses are shutting down. 46,000 is not a small number. This is economic. The tourism, they were attracting 5 million tourists a year. 5 million tourists a year, I think, if I'm not mistaken, if I've got the Tanzanian statistics right, we get a million visitors a year? Two million? What are the Tanzanian numbers? With all the national parks and Kilimanjaro that we have. Israel attacks, uh, attracts five million tourists a year. It has gone down to 270,000. From five million to 270,000 tourists. And even these tourists, I don't know how they're going there. Eliyat port, which was their main port in the south, because of the Yemeni attacks in the Red Sea, ships have stopped going there. And Israel depends, dependence on sea imports. Imports from the sea is 80%. This port has filed for bankruptcy. It has closed down because no ships were going in there. And not only that, but Egypt is also suffering because of the closure of the Red Sea. There's another 
story altogether what is happening to Egypt. Yeah, they are also boiling. Egypt is another boiling frog. Sorry, Egypt, yes. So this is as far as economy is concerned. Society. So this is the waiting game. You can see the effects. People feel like nothing is happening, Iran is not doing enough. But you can see the effects. And Sun Tzu, as he said, when the enemy is in panic, don't interrupt. Let it go on. Society, effects on the society. From the safest place for Jews, it has become the least safe place for Jews in the world. They call migration to Israel, the word they use is Aliyah. Now there is a reverse Aliyah. 500,000 Jews, this is according to them, their media have left the country. It is going up to 2 million. Two million. Uh, no, yes, they have left Israel. You see? There are many on the queue at uh, Tel Aviv Airport. Ben Gurion Airport. Yeah. Asant. 250,000 have been displaced from northern Israel. This has never happened before. They have been displaced. So it's least safe. People don't have confidence. Says how, and, they're going, and they're saying we'll never go back. 80% of the Jews in diaspora are saying we'll never go back to Israel again. So if you remember the two legs of the frog. One was for Jews to come and settle in, in Israel. 80% are saying we are not going back. So that leg is broken into multiple pieces. Not only that, but now you have a multipolar world. You had a unipolar world which gave Israel the impunity to act the way they wanted. Now we have the multipolar world. You have BRICS, you have the Shanghai Corporation, the closeness of Russia and China. And now what is happening is the effects are felt in Africa also. Western Africa, Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, and the global south, and some Asian countries also, they're breathing that we have an alternative. Not only them, but Saudi Arabia. They are also breathing now, that we have somewhere else to fall on. We can't just depend on the US. So the Arabian countries also, in West Asia, they are also banking on BRICS. Turkey has applied. And the most interesting applicant for BRICS, they just put in their application before Turkey. Can you guess who applied for membership in BRICS? Yemen. Yemen is one, but more interesting it was Palestine. Palestine, yes. Palestine has also applied to join BRICS. And Yemen also. So Pepe Escobar was talking about Yemen. He says the way people would say, see them, I call it the Lungi Mirungi effect. <laughs> if you see the Yemenis, their appearance, the world looked down upon them. The Arab world looked down upon them. They don't know anything about economics. These are wild people. They are jahil. And you can imagine they come down to Russia and they're negotiating with the Russians. They are asking for details about bricks. He says, we are surprised the amount of material that they knew. So the very smart people. This has been the biggest surprise of this waiting game. Yemen has come and it's the hero. The men of the match, as I, I call them. So just to conclude, I would want to... So it remains to be seen now. Where does our part of the world fall? We see some changes. What happened in Kenya recently? We need to start connecting the dots. Is it connected to what is happening in West Asia? Is this this multipolar world that is shifting the tectonic place, the political tectonic place? We have an election coming down in our country also now, 2024, 2025, with the changes, how is Tanzania going to be? Very interesting, we need to start reading newspapers, we need to start reading local newspapers. Locally, I think the East African is a good newspaper to read. 
the East African for those of you. It comes once a week. It has good information. Um, so just you should keep your fi our fingers. We should keep our fingers on the on the pulse. So just to finish this verse of the of the Quran, there's a test that the people of West Asia are going through. There's a test that the Russians are going through. And many parts of Africa, we have experienced relative peace here, but that is also an imtihan for us. So Allah says, Surah Baqarah, verse number 214, Audhu billahi min shaytanir Do you suppose that you'll enter paradise, though there has not yet come to you the like of what befell those who went before you? مَسَّتْهُمُ الْبَأْسَاءُ وَالضَّرَّاءُ وَالزُّلْزِلُ حَتَّى يَقُولُ الرَّسُولُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَعَهُ مَتَى نَصْرُ اللَّهِ إِنَّا نَصْرَ اللَّهِ قَرِيب I want to focus on this last word. So stress and distress befell them and they were convulsed. زُلْزِلُ Until the Prophet, not only the people, but the Prophet also asked, who were with him, the Prophet and his followers asked, when will Allah's help come? And behold, Allah's help is indeed near. This verse should give us hope, but it should also give us a level of fear, because just as our brothers have gone through imtihan, there's an imtihan awaiting us also. There's an imtihan of peace, which is the imtihan of shukr, and there's imtihan of sabr. So Zulzilu could happen here also. We need to be prepared and aware. Allah says you will not enter Jannah unless you go through the test that others have gone through. And the last verse, إِنَّهُمْ يَرَوْنَهُ بَعِيدًا Indeed, they see it distant. وَنَرَاهُ قَرِيبًا But we see it near. When we analyze, we feel nothing is happening. And many people feel it's very distant. But here this ayat says, Wanarahu Kariba. The people of God see the victory very, very close. So we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us aware, to keep us interested in what is happening. He should give us the ability to follow the happenings in West Asia. But more importantly, he should give us the ability to maintain our, our faith. Thabbit qulubana ala deenik. It shouldn't be that the imtihan comes and we fail in the imtihan. So Allah says, when the eye of Allah comes, when the eye of Allah comes, it is only the preparation that we made before the ayah came. Those are going to be beneficial. If you are in time of relative peace, this is the time to prepare so may Allah. Increase out our tawfiqat in preparation for those testing times, insha'Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.